What's up, everybody? Let's start off here with a couple of questions. Let's say you're, you've been attending church here at this beautiful cathedral for the last couple of years. And you finally get to know the preacher or priest a little bit. And the two of you are alone talking one day in here. And he says, yeah, you see this big, magnificent cathedral we're in? I had demons build it for me. Yeah, I have control over demons. And they built this whole thing for me. Not only that, but they've given me knowledge that no other human being knows. They even show me where gold and other jewels are buried in the ground, which has made me the wealthiest man alive. And I'm not even sure if it's the money or the power, but I can have any woman I want out there. I've got 700 wives right now, daughters of kings and queens and nobility. I've just got a whole mansion set up just for them. Now, what would you think of that priest? I mean, what would you think of anybody that told you that they had control over demons and had them doing their bidding at any given time? Well, that might sound like a really strange hypothetical to be starting off with, but that's the story of King Solomon. The Bible talks about the great wisdom of Solomon and the riches he had. But even in there, by the time he died, he betrays God and makes offering to other gods because of a woman. Let's just say lust. And a quick side note, you guys remember that video I did a little while back saying how all the old depictions of angels showed them with birds' feet? Well, same thing with demons, apparently. But back to lust, it seems like King Solomon didn't control his lust very well and just married every single woman that he wanted. Well, Asmodeus is known as the demon of lust. He was one of the first demons captured in the Testament of Solomon that we'll get to in a minute. And the more I look at the big picture of things, the more it seems like people today are still wanting to, let's say, gather the favor of Asmodeus, which comes at a price. Now, outside of the Bible, every single book out there about Solomon is dealing with Solomon and his demons and how to control demons. Now, to me, there seems to be a huge juxtaposition between the Old Testament Torah of the Bible saying that Solomon is the most revered king to have ever lived, and he built the holiest temple ever to the one true God, when all the other books on the matter are concerned with exactly how Solomon was able to control demons so that someone else can acquire all of that wealth and power. And I'm not sure how far down that rabbit hole I'm willing to take you guys because some things you need to just learn on your own. But it's definitely a question worth asking. You might also be asking why in the Vatican there's an attendance hall that is pretty clearly an homage to a snake all the way down to the fangs. I mean, you think this was an accident? And behind the popa is this statue that is something straight out of a bad dream. While every other church in the world uses either Jesus on the cross or just the sign of the cross, here we have someone, I'm sure you're supposed to think that this is Jesus, I'm not so sure that it is, looks like they're escaping from a pit. To me, nothing about this says rejoice, your salvation is here. And I'll just leave that right there. A quick reminder, uh, Freemasonry traces its origins back to the original Solomon's Temple. And they're not just concerned with the architectural process of the temple's creation, but also as, as self-growth and enlightenment. What did the serpent offer Eve in the Garden of Eden? That if you eat of the fruit, you shall not surely die, but your eyes shall be open and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So knowledge is what he offered. It may seem like I'm throwing out random stuff here, but these are all stories that everybody knows that most people haven't sat down and really thought about. And let's face it, these old stories have traveled a long way to get to us. There's two very clear choke points that I can see that this knowledge had to pass through in history to get to our present day. And I can't help but think that the line between good and evil might have been blurred along the way. Just look at all of the stuff that's come out about all of these rich, powerful people in recent years. How did they get to where they're at? Was it through hard work, or did they have some help? As far back as Solomon and every point in between, you can find these people employing the use of magicians, which is controlling demons, to get what you want. 
This is what St. Thomas Aquinas said on the subject. The intellectual substances, the demons, whose assistance these arts employ are not well disposed according to virtue. Moreover, one is not well disposed in terms of intellect if he is incited to lend assistance through committed crimes. However, this happens in these arts, for it is recorded that some, in practicing them, have oft innocent children. Therefore, these arts do not employ the assistance of an intellect well disposed to virtue. So here he's just saying that these people do some bad things. He continues, Now magicians call upon those whose assistance they employ as though they were their superiors, and as soon as they appear, they command them as inferiors. Let me put that in plain English. I've heard a lot of stories on this subject, and I'm not sure which way is correct. And it's something I have no desire to delve deeply into. I'm a firm believer in see no, hear no, speak no evil. I don't watch horror movies. I'm not into these sickos fantasies that work for production companies. But there are a few elements that seem universal to all of this. One is the magic circle and the seal within it. By some accounts, the demon is supposed to appear within this circle and is trapped inside of there. By other accounts, the practitioner is supposed to be inside of the circle for protection. And it's probably intentionally confusing whether you're supposed to use a pentagram or the six-sided star. Some accounts have Solomon's seal looking like this. And while we're here, I think it's just strange that the emblem of a nation is based off of a sign designed to capture demons. But the point I'm getting at here is this sign is implemented in order to keep the magician safe from whatever he summons. Raise no more demons than you can set down. Just because you went through all of this trouble doesn't mean that one of these are going to appear to you. The Lesser Key of Solomon deals with 72 of the top-ranking demons. So this would be like you sending an email to the 72 of the top CEOs in the world and expecting them to get back to you. What do you have to offer them? You think they're going to stop what they're doing and come attend to your needs just for fun? Probably not. Unless you have something to offer them that they really want. Or unless you truly have some secret knowledge that gives you power over them. But this is what Thomas Aquinas is referring to when saying that you summon them as if they're a superior, and then once they get here, you treat them as an inferior to do your bidding. Aquinas also infers that the magician is not a very smart person who actually does this. I'm trying to keep this fairly short, so I'm not going into a full explanation of the djinn and demons, but it can be said that you are summoning an entity that has been around for thousands and thousands of years, even since before our modern world, and that these entities are much smarter than you are, and it's really easy to flip the tables to where instead of you controlling them, they're controlling you. I really can't help but think about that when I'm reading the Testament of Solomon, because the second time that he summons Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he set him down on a raised seat of honor. See how he's now kind of showing respect to Beelzebub, Beelzebul? See, the first time they met, Beelzebul had said, it is I who make manifest the apparition of each demon. And he promised to bring in bonds all of the unclean spirits, and then Solomon glorified the God of heaven and earth. Uh, Look, I'm just thinking thoughts and asking questions that I don't have answers to. But you got to admit that something is fishy when you're talking about Solomon as the most righteous, wisest king of all time. And then on the other hand, Aleister Crowley is writing books about him on how to contact evil spirits. Last video I did on this subject, I pointed out how usually when there's some entity offering you wealth and power and all of your worldly desires, it's not God that's offering those. It's usually a Faustian bargain or a deal with the devil. If we look at this from a Christian perspective, the demons are fallen angels. They rebelled against God and they were cast out of heaven. Some would even say that it's a punishment to the Nephilim, the sons of the fallen angels. But let's just go with rebels who were kicked out of heaven. Now, if we look at the Islam tradition, they say these are the jinn, and that the jinn were a whole nother creation before mankind, and that Iblis was the highest ranking among them. The whole race of jinn that had populated the earth previous to mankind, and they were basically just like us. They they had tribes, they had religions, they they married each other, but they had turned wicked and started killing each other, and so God sent 
Iblis along with all of his angels down and wiped them all out. Then he formed Adam out of clay and he breathed life into him and then ordered all the angels in heaven to bow down to Adam. And Iblis said, no, I'm not bowing down to this. He's mud. I'm made of a smokeless fire. I'm better than him. So Iblis became the shaitan, the adversary, where we get our name Satan. So no matter how you look at this, they were rebellious to God and no longer followed his orders. But in the Testament of Solomon, Solomon had been praying to have control over the demons because he was hurting a boy that he liked, just put it shortly. And he says the archangel Michael brought him a little ring, and with it thou shalt lock up all the demons of the earth, male and female, and with their help shall build Jerusalem. So if all it took to lock up all the demons was this little ring, then why didn't God or one of the angels do it already? Just part of the ineffable plan, I guess. But Beelzebul tells Solomon that it is I who make manifest the apparition of each demon. And then he promised to bring in bonds all of the unclean spirits. So who has control over the rebels, the demons? God or Beelzebul? Well, let's jump to the end of the Testament of Solomon and see what the end result of all of this was. So this whole time, Solomon glorified God for giving him wisdom, giving him power over the demons, giving him all the riches of the world. And he took wives from every land who were numberless. And then he marched against the Jebusins and saw the daughter of a man and fell violently in love with her. So he said to their priests, a priest of Moloch, to give me this woman as a wife. And they said, well, if you want her, then go in and worship our gods, Raphan and the god Moloch. So the priest told the girl that don't sleep with him until he has completed a sacrifice to our gods. So she made it seem innocent enough and said, well, look, here's five grasshoppers. Just take them and crush them together in the name of Moloch, and then I'll sleep with you. Solomon says, and this I actually did, and at once the Spirit of God departed me, and I became weak as well as foolish in my words. And after that, I was obliged by her to build a temple of uh, idols to Baal, to Rapha, and to Moloch. I then, wretch that I am, followed her advice, and the glory of God quite departed from me, and my spirit was darkened, and I became the sport of idols and demons. Wherefore, I wrote out this testament, that ye who get possession of it may pity and attend to the last things and not to the first. So, I mean, he's really saying here that all of those great things that I did in this life, you guys shouldn't be revering me for that. You should be pitying me for those last little things that I did that I threw it all away. So, I'm sorry, I know you're not supposed to question the Bible, the one that these guys had exclusive control over in Latin, when nobody spoke Latin for hundreds of years. And if you were caught with a Bible, then the Inquisition put the fear of God into you. But I can't help but wonder if it was God that gave Solomon all of his wisdom in the first place. Who was it that offered Eve the knowledge of good and evil, and ye shall be like gods in the first place? God, supposedly, came to Solomon after he had gone up to the most important high place and offered a thousand burnt offerings on the altar. But all throughout the Bible, they use the term high places to mean a place of worshiping false gods. And Gibeon was the most important high place. And here they're explaining it away, saying, in most contexts, high places are associated with false worship. However, in Solomon's worship at the high place in Gibeon, he worshipped at the tabernacle. It was only after the temple was completed that Gibeon was no longer considered a place to worship the Lord. Now, that alone wouldn't give me pause to think. But when the Talmud and all of Islam says that Solomon accomplished everything he did by the use of demons, then it just adds a little more flavor to the story. So what was the end result of Solomon's reign? Well, it was the fall of Israel. The kingdom split into two, the ten tribes of Israel to the north, who for some reason we don't hear anything else about throughout all of history, but still to this day we hear a lot about the southern kingdom of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin that allied with them. This was just before the Babylonian exile that I'll get to in a second. But after Solomon, Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord. They provoked him with, with their sins, which uh, were above all that their fathers had done. 
They also built them high places, which in every case except for Solomon's is a bad thing. And there were also sodomites in the land, which in some definitions they refer to that as male prostitutes. And to put this into a context, the priests used to run <laughs> brothels. They, they ran the prostitutes. And this continued all the way through the Catholic Church through the Middle Ages. Temples and prostitutes have basically always been synonymous with one another. But ultimately, after Solomon, revolts broke out over who should be king, and the kingdom split into two. Israel became the northern kingdom, while Judah became the southern. So the Judeans didn't even keep the name of the Israelites. They said, no, we're Judeans. The other ten tribes, the majority of everyone, can go their own way. Now they're really quick to say that, oh, no, we're the Israelites. So then the northern kingdom falls to the Assyrians. Some of them fled down to Judah, and they lasted for another 135 years, allegedly. And then King Nebuchadnezzar attacked them, burned all of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and took them all to Babylon. This is known as the Babylonian exile or Babylonian captivity. It's also where you get the Babylonian Talmud and money magic and all kinds of crazy stuff that is associated with uh, these guys now. Then during the Persian period under Cyrus the Great, this is modern day Iran, they were allowed to return to Jerusalem, rebuild a temple, just to have it all <laughs> destroyed again by the Romans in a couple hundred years. But not everybody wanted to return to Jerusalem, so they dispersed, and this is known as the Diaspora. And I'll just say that that's the way this article explains it. It's too complicated and too late in the video to get into it thoroughly. But ultimately, what this resulted in was all throughout the Middle Ages, a group of people that lived in everybody else's countries that didn't follow their local customs, their local laws, one being usury that was illegal for Christians to do, but they were allowed to do it, and they were sanctioned by the catholics to do it. And both groups became very wealthy and powerful through this practice. Powerful enough that by the late 19th century, they were embedded within governments around the world and decided that they should have a third try at controlling Jerusalem. Third time's the charm, right? You can see how well it's going for everybody right now over there, right? Anyway, the end result of the great revered King Solomon was the absolute destruction of the entire nation. Ah, but he had a nice temple. You gotta give him that. It was a nice temple. He was so rich that he ate diamonds so his dookie would twinkle. Ah, what do you know? Anyway, that's most of the story of Solomon. And looking at all of this, I can't help but wonder, did God really give him all of this wisdom and all of this wealth and everything? Or was he getting played by a demon the whole time? After all, Beelzebul told him that it is I who make manifest the apparition of each demon and then promise to bring him all the unclean spirits in bonds. So who was it that really gave him this ring in the first place? I think it's a legit question, and we'll get into the Babylonian Talmud and Asmodeus later. Static out.